Welcome to the Responsible Research and Innovation Tools Project. I'm Steve Miller and I'm the lead researcher at University College London, which is the UK hub for the RRI Tools Project. And with me today is Professor Dave Delpy. Professor Delpy has just stood down as the Chief Executive Officer of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council here in the United Kingdom. So, Dave, thank you very much indeed for coming along and being with us today. It's a pleasure. When I say responsible research and innovation, just what does that convey to you? To me, it conveys something that any good researcher thinks of as part of the research that they're undertaking. Uh, being a researcher means uh, having good ideas but also then thinking of the potential impacts of that research and the potential consequences of that research. I don't see it as a, a separate item that is divorced from research. It is part of being a good researcher, especially if we're spending public money. And while you were Chief Executive at the Research Council, you made it not quite mandatory, but certainly um, recommended that researchers did think about these issues around responsibility in both their research and innovation that might follow from it. How did that work out in practice? It was an interesting uh, exercise, um, and it actually arose from the societal issues panel that we had established as a group of experts to give us advice on the societal issues that arise from the research rather than the technological issues. Uh, they were very keen that as we moved into areas of research and grand challenges in the engineering, the physical sciences, which had some quite significant societal impacts, whether it's in terms of climate change, whether it's uh, the production of materials that may uh, last in the environment or have health uh, uh, implications, or geoengineering, that we uh, actually set down some, uh, some ground rules, some guidance for the researchers. And so uh, we started a series of exercises which eventually resulted in a paper going to council and the Framework for Responsible Innovation published in 2013. And was that something that your research community welcomed? Uh, did they look on it as another box that they had to tick or did they say, no, you know, this has got some real value for us? I mean, I think the answer was, of course, it was all of those things. There were some parts of the community who thought, you know, gosh, why are we doing this? It isn't relevant to my area of research. Um, and there were some parts of the community who were really interested in seeing how this should happen. Uh, we were very keen on public engagement on trying to increase the ways in which the community could understand what our researchers were doing and some of our research, uh, research community really saw this as an interesting way of providing a new, uh, a, a new piece of information for the, for the public about what science was and what it did other than just the technology. So not quite uh, co-production of knowledge but at least public involvement in what some of your research community were carrying out? Oh yes, certainly uh, public involvement. We, we, we started with some, uh, some early exercises uh, to see how this would work and we uh, held a, a, two public dialogues, one on, uh, the, on nanotechnology in the environment, another on uh, synthetic biology. Uh, and in fact we then also held a dialogue on um, the public view of what should be a priority for a nanotechnology research investment. Uh, we actually asked the public which areas of nanotechnology should we be putting our money into and that advice fed into the selection panel who in the end made the peer reviewed uh, selection of projects in that area. We introduced the concept of, of life, life cycle assessment mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, you didn't have to answer the question right at the outset, but part of the project was to continually reassess as the results, as the research was undertaken and the results came in, to continually reassess uh, that responsible innovation question. And I think that did change the, both the outputs and the way that the researchers approached the, the, the research in, 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 in question. And did you get anything by way of surprises out of these exercises? Oh, I think we did. In the synthetic 
biology dialogue, for instance, uh, it came across to us uh, much more strongly than we'd anticipated that the public expected the scientists to actually be thinking of the consequences, mm -hmm. not, not in, in a way that would prevent the research from taking place, but they wanted people to think, well, if I am doing this research and there are potential uh, hazardous consequences, perhaps they're, you know, they're outweighed by potential benefit, how should I undertake that research in a responsible way? So the public were not against uh, adventurous research and in fact really quite speculative and one could almost say dangerous research, but they expected the scientists to give some thought to, uh, to what they were doing and why they were doing it and how they were doing it. One of the key concerns in responsible research and innovation is the issue of genders, both in terms of the research community itself and in terms of how it might be received by our fellow citizens. Mm. Were gender issues important in your uh, framework for responsible research and innovation? Mm. Um, I, I mean, they should be, uh, or they should have played a much larger uh, part than they probably did. I mean, the reality is that in the engineering and physical sciences we have a, 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 an appalling gender misbalance, uh, far too many men and far too few female researchers. On the other hand, of course, the general public that we interacted with uh, were at least 50-50 and in fact I suspect probably uh, slightly more biased in terms of female engagement and the approach that uh, the researchers took in presenting their, their research, I think, uh, was certainly adapted as the community, especially the women in the audience, asked questions from a slightly different viewpoint, or one that I suspect many of them hadn't really thought of when they were originally preparing their speech. But you would say that having this kind of public consultation did make a difference to the outcomes of uh, what was being funded and even what uh, came out of the research projects themselves. Yes, I think it did. I, I mean, the, the particular dialogue was in the healthcare area on nanotechnologies and uh, the only thing that they expressed a really strong concern about was an area called theranostics. And theranostics is where you have uh, very clever nano-based sensors those sensors also then interact with a delivery, a drug delivery system or whatever, uh, and automatically provide the, uh, close, close the loop and provide the medication. Uh, and the public were concerned by the, the human decision making being taken out of the loop. Um, given that it's the public who are on the receiving ends of the, uh, the, the treatments, then obviously you can't just blindly go in and say, right, here's the machine, uh, do what the machine says. It's clear that your research council was fairly committed in terms of its high level, its council, its high level committees towards responsible research and innovation. What about the challenge of getting some of the kind of the ethos, if you like, that you've adopted in council and in your leading committees down all the way to the laboratory bench? I mean, this is all about uh, about changing the way people work, changing people's views and attitudes, and uh, it, it takes time. Uh, some areas will move faster than others. The way that we uh, thought we could best do this, in fact, was through the Centres for Doctoral Training. As you probably know, we've just put out an enormous uh, amount of money in uh, the form of now some 113 centres for doctoral training, a large call, and one of the things that we explicitly stated in the original call was that uh, in addition to the very subject specific training that people would get as part of the, uh, the CDT experience, we would expect uh, some training and some thought to be given to responsible innovation. So you know, if you start uh, right at the outset and the students are, are, are trained to, to, to regard this as part of what is normal research, then we'll, uh, I think we'll probably get a more rapid change there, mm -hmm. not just because of the students, but of course their supervisors have to also uh, be aware of what the students are being taught and what the students are thinking. Do you think there's any role for the public in terms of the training that goes into these doctoral training centres that young researchers and their supervisors might receive? 
I think there is. Um, the there there are some problems uh, both in terms of time and effort in doing it and, uh, and the costs associated with that. Uh, given that our budgets have been cut on the admin side, it, it is harder to do that than it has been in the in the past. And hopefully, the universities that we're working through will be undertaking that sort of engagement. Uh, the advantage of having a large number of centres is that they all have a public engagement. They all have a responsible innovation programme as part of their training. And so, it'll be interesting to see which ones do it almost in a sort of closed way within the university and which of them actually go out and, and use the public, uh, lay members of the public, to help both on the course and in the development of that material. So RRI tools is mm -hmm. supposed to be helping. If there were one or maybe two things that you really wish that we could produce, what do you think they would be? What I'd like to see is a, a broader take up by the other funders, not just other councils, but other funding agencies, because you know, to be honest, this is something that is common to all research. Uh, and although we at EPSRC have pushed it in a particular direction because we've seen a need for it, this should be a common tool that all research funding agencies uh, both would use and would require their researchers to be aware of. You can have the best possible intentions, a very ethical way of working, whilst the knowledge, if you like, is being generated inside the university or the institutional research laboratory. But then it has to get out into the commercial world. It has to, if you like, make money. Mm -hmm. That seems to me an enormous challenge. How did EPSRC begin to face up to that kind of challenge, a challenge of innovation? Yes. I mean, interestingly, within our own academic research community, that was probably most strongly represented by the engineering community as opposed to the very basic science community. Uh, but as you know, EPSRC has a series of strategic partnerships with a variety of companies. Uh, and in fact, we're just going to start a project with Shell uh, where they are going to share with us um, how they deal with responsible innovation from a commercial point of view. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see the, uh, the approach that our engineers who are working in the Shell domain, uh, it, to see whether their ideas are different and their approaches are different from those of the engineers who've transitioned over to the other side into the commercial domain. But that's the way in which we're trying to address that question because yes, you're right, most often the consequences become much, much clearer once you move into the actual translation into the, uh, the implementation of the research. So you're saying there's quite a challenge, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> We've got well, to do you set me a difficult challenge, but I'll set you one in return. <laughs> and why not? <laughs> why not? Dave Delpy, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.